Mozart. Otherworldly genius. Childlike naive. Divine gift from God. Serene marble bust of transcendent perfection. Or even a bowl of perfectly smooth chocolate. All of it, the stuff of myth and legend. Mozart, you see, was a human being, just like you and me. Except he could express the pain and pleasure, the joy and darkness of being human more completely and more humanly than any other composer. His music isn't merely perfect or beautiful or genius. It's visceral. Violent. Avant-garde and powerfully expressive. And it was written by a composer and a person who's still modern today. Someone who made mistakes and who tried unbelievably hard to make them right. Welcome to the joy of Mozart. Vienna put up this statue in 1896. It's a monumental fiction about Mozart's life and music, an excrescence of marble, bronze and gold leaf that turns Mozart into a hyper-romantic genius, someone literally and figuratively above the rest of humanity, someone different from us. It's ludicrous. So what we have to do, for Mozart's sake and our own, is take him off the plinth. It was a strange revelation the first time I heard Mozart's music. I've spent years trying to explain why Mozart's A Major Symphony, K201, affected me so deeply when I heard it played by the Scottish Chamber Orchestra at the age of seven. I do know, though, it wasn't about beauty or perfection. It was about exactly the opposite. To try to find my Mozart, the one who explains who I am, I'm starting at the end, here in Vienna, where he lived for the last 10 years of his life, from 1781. In a house on this spot, on the 5th of December, 1791, Mozart died. And at the same moment, something else was born, the Mozart myth. The myth becomes powerful because people want to believe it. <laughs> I don't think you should dismiss the myths simply because they are factually not completely true. They tell us an enormous amount about what we want to believe about great composers, about inspiration, about people who die young, about people whose work is unfinished. And some of these myths are absolutely reflected in fact. Mozart, the child prodigy, was a fact. Born in Salzburg in 1756, he composed over 600 pieces of catalogue music in a life lasting a mere 35 years, starting at the tender age of five. The infant genius was mythologised most vividly in Hollywood's Oscar gobbling movie Amadeus. This lavish biopic imagined all the tricks that Wolfgang and his sister were made to perform by their father Leopold as he paraded them around the courts of Europe, travelling from country to country by carriage. By the age of ten, Mozart had already written some astonishing sonatas and symphonies. It's a powerful story that could uh, uh, apply to so many artists, that here they are divinely inspired geniuses whose worth is not recognised and they are continually exploited by people uh, who take advantage of them. It makes him appear at once human because of this innocence, but divine because he, his music comes from another source. Maybe mm. it's just unprecedented this talent to come from wherever and for it to be so perfect and just to, to, to come out like that and to, to write these works at such a, such a young age. Mm. Yeah. Mozart's favourite string instrument was the viola. It's musician Lawrence Powers too. He's often played Mozart's Sinfonia Concertante, written in response to the composer's early experiences of adult life, 
with its disappointments and tragedies. <laughs> it's a big responsibility when you play this music. Unlike any other music, I, I don't know, I don't know why, but it's there's an extra level of sort of adrenaline and nerves when dealing with that music. His mother had just died while he was away. Um, he was looking for employment. He didn't find employment. He was looking for a wife who turned him down. And I'm sure he would have performed this with his father. And I think there's there's some sort of role there. You know, the, the viola has this wonderfully sort of conciliatory role. You know, it's always sort of looking after the violin who's somehow more worried and questioning. You already start to feel that the viola's sort of answering in a, in a very sort of... Um, fatherly way. And the conversation becomes sort of heartbreaking at points, you know. It's um, very special. It's this sense of dialogue in that piece, I think, mm. that sort of make it sort of his first mature piece. <laughs> Why do you think Mozart wanted to play the viola himself as opposed to the violin or even the cello? It's a very sort of emotional sounding instrument, I think. You know, it's very close to the speaking voice. It has a certain amount of, you know, pathos to it, just naturally, even when you tune a viola, it has that. I mean, I was thinking on the way here, I mean, he was 22 when he wrote mm. Contratante, which is obviously a masterpiece. You know, I can't, I can't sort of get my head around that. <laughs> mm. I mean, it opens up lots of questions, not just musical. Another stubborn Mozart myth is that his music was written down perfectly first time, as if dictated directly by God. I met Professor Cliff Eisen in the British Library to discover firsthand the scribbled, scratchy truth. Have a look at this then. This is the, the, the final page of Mozart's own manuscript of the Hunt Quartet, which is the, the B flat major vocal rating 458. Now, look, this is the, the most defiant crossing out. This, is a, this goes beyond a mistake. He didn't want anyone to see. We, we, uh, even through all this cross hatching, you can hardly see what yeah. he's trying to rub out. This is actually a passage that was meant to be inserted earlier in the piece and then decided that he didn't want that insertion after all. So it, it represents three, if not more, attempts to kind of go through the piece and decide what works and what doesn't work. He's changing his mind. He, you know, he's making that. He's not always sure. Far from being always sure, he's not. In fact, many other pages in these uh, six quartets dedicated to Haydn reveal the same thing. All of these documents that are spread around us are, are treated and have been treated for close on 200 years as relics mm -hmm. that, that we don't interrogate in any way to find out more about the person or more about the times, and yet they aren't relics. They're living documents of a variety of different processes and a variety of different times, places, activities that Mozart was involved with. One of the most touching documents in all of Mozart's life is that thematic catalogue where he writes out the beginnings of his pieces from 1784 onwards. And the touching thing about that document, which is in the British Library and as, uh, it can be seen, is not the lists of works, but the fact that when you get to the end of it, there are pages and pages of empty, unfilled staves. The thematic catalogue of all of my works from February 1784 until the month, and he's left a space for the year he's written one because he wasn't sure when it, this was going to be still the 17th, the 18th century, or indeed the beginning of the 19th century, and then a full stop, which of course uh, he never finished because he died in 1791. The, so the, the first page then this is the first list of pieces. He lived to complete, he lived to fill in 29 uh, of the 40 or so pages. Here's the very final page. Now, in a way, the, the most obviously moving thing about what happens is the, is the, the empty pages. Look at the, the empty stages of the pieces he wouldn't write.
this doesn't conjure up for me the last moments of Mozart and the idea that it's some kind of testamentary page. The other thing that I'm impressed with is what people want to make of this, right? It, it becomes one of the living, surviving artifacts of the fact of Mozart's premature death. It, it conjures up this, this, this story that we want to believe, this, this idea of a life cut off. But Cliff, what's the problem with this? Clearly, look, just turn to this page of the next catalog. This is a life unfair. It, it, doesn't, matter how, it doesn't matter how we play it. it, doesn't, it in a way, to take the idea of what we might feel about it out of the equation, you know, this was a life cut short. This clearly was a life cut mm. short. No, no, I don't, I don't mean in any way to diminish uh, the impact of Mozart's premature death and all of the perfectly natural feelings and wishes and desires and hopes and aspirations that we might have that were unfulfilled because of it. Rather, I think what I'm saying is that Mozart becomes reified. Mozart becomes removed from, this is just, this is, this is a great heroic mythical story in some ways. And, and so we then are afraid to approach Mozart okay. because of the power of this story. Because he's not, he's not like us. He's not he's like not us. He's us. not like us. I mean, and, and yet, and yet that seems like such a, uh, an uncommonsensical thing, and, and it's an idea we don't attribute to other artists, right? And we've discussed, you know, Shakespeare was a real person. Leonardo was a real person. They were all real people. But somehow Mozart it became not an engaged, living, genuine human being anymore. And here is the myth made real. These chocolate Mozart bowls are the tip of the Mozart mythberg. Mozart reified into little gold-wrapped confections and the sound of saccharin in this soupy recording of Eine kleine Nachmusik. Lovely. It occurs to me what these things actually are. They're, um, they're transubstantiations of the Mozartian myth. People literally want to eat a piece of him. So the question is, of course, uh, what they, uh, in fact, taste like. Um, rather nice dark chocolate on the outside. Incredibly sweet. Marzipan and praline. Mm. Really quite sickly, in fact. These are really the um, confectionery embodiment of sentimentality. I mean, I'm going to finish it, obviously. Wow. <laughs> I think Mozart himself would have been, A, astonished, but B, really chuffed <laughs> to know uh, that for perpetuity he was going to be in a chocolate ball. <laughs> I mean, that would have amused him on many levels. Um, or that all this um, sort of tackiness, actually, I think he would have loved it. But there's a bitterness in that sweetness, too. Mozart may have been born in Salzburg, but the city treated him as no more than a hired hand when he was there. It was only on the 50th anniversary of his death in 1841 that they claimed him as their own. Salzburg erected this statue in his honor in the old market, which they renamed the Mozart Platz. That, I think, was the beginning of the Mozart industry. And after that, you know, it has just steamrolled and steamrolled. And it's almost as if they're atoning for all those years when they behaved so badly to him. We can't be completely sure what Mozart looked like, uh, but we can be sure that he didn't look like this. This, though, is the single most reproduced image in today's world of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. This is the face of Mozart bowls. And, um, the bowls here really is to do with uh, the relationship between image and reality. Contemporary accounts of Mozart say that he was small, that he was pockmarked, that he had a large nose, that he had protruding eyes. None of that is reflected in this Errol Flynn airbrushing that's going on here. The one thing I think I am pretty certain of is that if Mozart were to see this, the face of a more than five billion euro industry, a Mozart brand, he would simply say, who the hell is this guy? And look, Vienna's got in on the act just as much as Salzburg. Nice weeks, guys. I can't take this any longer. I can't stand the Mozart industry. 
not just because it airbrushes his image, but because it airbrushes his music and how we think about what it sounds like. The industry wants you to believe that Mozart is a superficial, sentimentalised, nostalgic, courtly entertainer. But that's the exact opposite of what he spent his whole life doing. He was trying to express the full range of human expression, ambiguities, doubts. He confronts us with all of that in our essential humanity. And all of this is a betrayal. I realised that this music that I'd previously ignored or reviled because it sounded quaint or peculiar or because I didn't understand it was actually really radical and, and actually mostly where the avant-garde had gone. The avant-garde, oddly, had gone into the past. You know, well, let's, let's try Mozart then because, you know, it's this all the time. It's, it's souvenirs, it's, it's the past, it's... But that's Wait, the, so, so how, did, how did you get past that? Because Mozart has had the odd toehold here and there. I'm thinking of Falco's Rock Me Amadeus. I'm thinking of the, the fact that this or a, this bust or a version of it is on the desk of Mr Garrison in every episode of South Park. The so chocolate how... box, tinkly, yeah. powdered wigs, child genius. And I realised, of course, that everybody makes up a Mozart. So I'll make up my own Mozart. I'd strip away everything. I'd strip away this, I'd strip away the, the cute pictures, I'd strip away the academic side. I'd even strip away the music to an extent and just begin again. And there was a way that I could begin again, I found, very, very quickly, which was something I found very contemporary, very modern and very abstract, which was the K numbers. Ah, oh, yes, the K numbers. The chronological catalogue of Mozart's works, as documented by this man, Ludwig von Kirchel, 70 years after the composer's death from K1, a minuet for piano written when Mozart was five, to K626, the Requiem, unfinished on his death only 30 years later. The K numbers, in a way, was my way of coming into it like it was a little like factory records, you know, a, a catalogue of amazing moments. And I would get to, a, let's say, a piano quartet, and that would be, say, 491, say. And then I would start to wonder... 493. 493, OK. And then I would start to wonder what's around it, then. And what I found startling, which really blew my mind, is that if you just go one way or the other, which means it was written more or less at the same time, on one side you'd say, correct me again, Tom, because I'm not good on the titles, you'd get Marriage of Figaro. 492. OK, and on the other side, oh, my God, you'd get a concerto, maybe 24. That, 491, there's, yeah. there's the piano concerto. I mean, that, but isn't that amazing? Doing the K numbers is not unlike watching an entire series of, of Breaking Bad over a weekend. You can do the K numbers in a week. You know, I, I can do them very quickly, actually, quite a few. And if, if there is a way, and I've thrown it back to you, Tom, again, of, of, of explaining that the K numbers, to an extent, it's like binge watching. It's that exciting. You know, for me, some of the K numbers, they are like a great series of Game of Thrones. K219 is his fifth, and I think his finest, violin concerto. But it's not the numbers that excite violinist Nicola Benedetti, it's the wildness of that solo part, the different characters he's creating in just a few seconds of music. To me, it sounds like so much enjoyment in his ability to create these voices. He's just toying with, with the listener, with, with him. He's, he's, he's constantly working out how can I make this as varied as possible, as expressive as possible, and enjoying it. You, you, can, you can sense the... Kind of almost euphoria. And I answer. So it's the same material, but mine is instantly feminine. And then. And then again, low, and then. You couldn't play this like the the tita ba, 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 no, yeah, well, tita, like nicely. It can't some, be nice. Some some <laughs> some do. <laughs> I just don't ever hear Mozart like that ever. Um, 
I, I just don't, I don't hear it in his voice. I don't hear it in his character. There's too much natural wildness. Um, and I think, I think Mozart with caution is just not doing him justice. I actually nearly hyperventilate. No, what's the thing when you, when you stop breathing? It's the opposite of yeah, that. Yeah, kind of asphyxiate. Right, I, I stop I breathing. Right, um, yeah. <laughs> that's what I do. I, during the development of this second movement, it's so this is the, the slow just movement, the slow the movement of the A major concerto, uh -huh. his last concerto, um, to me is just one of the most Stop breathing. You have a long held note in the winds. And now a syncopation. And at the end of it all, silence from the whole orchestra. And then back. And it's just, it is just the most, it's just so shocking and it literally takes your breath away. It doesn't matter how many times you hear it. One of the most unexpected and just glorious developments of a second movement ever. <laughs> From the sublime to the holy, this is Salzburg Cathedral with its five organs which Mozart would have played and where much of his early sacred music was first performed. It's grand, yes, but only occasionally inspired. The teenage Mozart had to write what Prince Archbishop Colorado and his court demanded, not a recipe for commitment. So what of Mozart's relationship with Catholicism, with God? Well, I think it's possible that Salzburg turned Mozart away from the institutions of the church and of writing sacred music. It was in his unfulfilling years here, working for Archbishop Colorado in Salzburg, that Mozart wrote the vast majority of his church music, because he had to. In fact, in his later life, there are just two major sacred works, both astonishing masterpieces. But he didn't finish either of them. There was the Mass in C minor, composed with soprano solos for his wife Constanza to sing when they came to Salzburg in 1783, for the only time in their lives together to meet Wolfgang's father, Leopold, who had disapproved of their marriage, and his sister, Nannerl. The C minor Mass was first performed here at St. Peter's on the 26th of October, 1783. Magnificent though it is, what audiences then and now hear and heard in the Mass in C minor is only an incomplete torso. Mozart, for some reason, couldn't complete the Mass in C minor, and he never returned to it either. 
And then there's the Requiem, unfinished, notoriously at Mozart's death on the 5th of December, 1791. Parts of which were performed for the first time here at St. Michael's Church in Vienna, conducted by his friend, the librettist of the Magic Flute, Emmanuel Schikaneder, just five days after he died. I had real problems with the, with the religious music um, because I think Mozart himself had problems with it. I mean, think of his religious music and think how unreligious it is. His earlier pieces are, are not that good. Get get to the C minor uh, uh, mass, which written is for Costanza and, and Salzburg. Absolutely unfinished. And unfinished. I mean, it starts off like an epic, you think this is going to be colossal mm. and it gradually runs out of puff. The same with the Requiem. What is it? Is that about a relationship with God, Catholicism, but what is that? I think that it's mean? to do with in, in, enlightened thought. I think it's to do with Freemasonry. I think Freemasonry is is a much more important kind of uh, centrifugal environment for Mozart. I think the religion is much more superstitious. Uh, it's more Masonic. It's more um, rational. Mozart has a tremendous fear of authority, a fear of dread. He can't really subscribe to, to the whole theological package. Mozart, the Mason, was a humanist at heart, and his music is a consecration of humanity in all its messy, joyous ambiguity. I think that's closer to his true spirituality than his relationship with organized religion. Beautiful, isn't it? But I think there's something claustrophobic about Salzburg. It's hemmed in on three sides by the fortress and by the mountains that surround it. And I think Mozart felt that sense of claustrophobia too. Ultimately, this was a place he had to escape from his employer, Archbishop Colorado, from his father, Leopold, and his family too. Born in Salzburg, maybe, but Mozart, the musician, the composer, was formed everywhere else, in Paris, in London, in Milan, in Mannheim, in Munich, and above all, in Vienna. Mozart had to get out. Mozart arrived in Vienna in 1781, determined to rewrite the musician's rule book. He probably performed here in the Sala Terena. After years of needling and frustration, Mozart made the astonishingly self-confident decision to become a freelance composer, independent of any court, a completely new phenomenon in Vienna. He knew he had as much honor as any nobleman, so why shouldn't he be their equal rather than their lackey? Now this really is the key moment of Mozart's adult life. His path towards personal and musical fulfillment and emancipation from Salzburg, from his father, towards new kinds of expression and his marriage to Constanze Weber had begun. This building was a symbol of Mozart's self-confidence, the grandest of the 14 apartments of Vienna that he lived in. He was the only composer at the time who could afford to live within Vienna's city walls, in demand as teacher, performer, impresario, as well as husband, father, pet owner, and billiard player. This house would have thrummed and thrilled with noise all day and all night. 
It's also the place where some of Mozart's most important compositions were heard for the very first time. The second day of his father's visit here on the 12th of February 1785, there was a performance of incredible significance that probably happened on the floorboards I'm standing on. The first three of six quartets Mozart would dedicate to Josef Haydn. Haydn came here to watch this performance. Leopold Mozart played one of the uh, violin parts and Mozart himself played the viola. These string quartets meant so much to him as a composer, as a human being, that he spent three years refining them. It's hard to imagine the effect of hearing that music for the first time, but we do have Josef Haydn's reaction. As he said simply to Leopold, your son before God is the greatest composer I have ever known. Fine. Christian Bezeigenhout's living room in London is dominated by an instrument that also came to define Mozart's life as both composer and performer, the forte piano, a much more intimate and colourful instrument than the modern-day grand. The piano, as a piece of equipment, had evolved during Mozart's short life, and he, in turn, would fulfil its as yet unrealised potential. We just have to get this one fully operational. Okay. So I tend to lift the pedal just to be sure. But there it is. This is the piece of equipment that might best serve the unbelievably mercurial and highly changeable surface texture of Mozart's music better than any other piece of equipment I'd ever played. I started learning pieces on it, um, and that was a fascinating, a fascinating journey to, to kind of go to zero and delete the preconceptions that we have from the world of playing the modern piano and start working on a piece on, on this piece of equipment and see what it tells us about Mozart's playing, his conceptions of sound, his approach to the piano, um, and how all of this is so deeply linked on every level. Three, three, three. <laughs> This is all where all this stuff happens. Mm -hmm. 283. Um, a piece like 282. Is one of these amazing people who bridges an incredible, uh, uh, bridges an incredible gap, historically speaking, and, and is at this sort of fascinating kind of crossroads in terms of instrumental equipment. This is an action that requires a lot of finger, finger spitzengefühl, I mean fingertip sensitivity, lots of finger work, hand delicacy. There isn't much of this kind of, you, you know, smashing and, and upper body um, activation that you might see on the Steinway. Mozart grew up with an unbelievably precise keyboard technique. When you want to write beautiful music, you write it here. When you're trying to express true trauma, you do it down there. I will say that this is a slightly later instrument than the one Mozart was writing about when he writes to his dad. And there are a lot of modifications in an action like this. This is a real prototypical Walter piano from the 1780s. The action remains essentially unchanged until the beginning of the 19th century. It's, it's a coming together of technology with what he can do as a composer and who he is as a person. Absolutely. All of those things come together. Yeah, it's a, it's a magic, it's a magic moment. Um, the other thing about it is it's so extraordinary is Mozart's gift at predicting these kind of blockbuster trends. In the decade from 81 to 91, the piano becomes the most important solo instrument for public consumption, essentially. I mean, it eclipses all other equipment in this period as the number one way to make your name as a massive virtuoso, really. From that point forward, he really writes exclusively for the piano. 
He somehow gets a new piece of equipment and understands immediately what makes it tick. Mozart's own piano, the one he played in Vienna, is now in Salzburg in a large apartment where the Mozart family once lived. It's now a museum where I can literally hear the ghost of the actual sounds that Mozart created with the help of its head of research, Ulrich Leisinger. Ulrich, this is Mozart's Vienna piano, the, the, the piano that he had with him from virtually the time he moved to Vienna until the end of his life. D just thinking about what he played, or this instrument and the music that, that happened here, it's, it's just an astonishing thought, really. Whatever we have from Mozart, if we have the portraits, they are not photographic. If we have the letters, Mozart tells us some things, but he conceals us others, and from time to time he's not telling the truth. But the instrument is telling the truth about Mozart's music, at least about the keyboard music, and so we can really learn a lot from carefully looking and listening to this instrument. This is really the instrument where all these great piano concertos were conceived, yeah. where they got their premiere performances and many follow-up performances during Mozart's lifetime, and so it's really a big stroke of luck that this instrument has survived in almost original shape. So. This isn't a concerto? No, this is, this is, is a not. Yeah. No, 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 it should not be a problem. I'm not Christian Besoden. <laughs> Mozart obviously loved this instrument. I mean, it was his constant companion for that decade in Vienna. He would have had enough money to replace it if he wanted to. I mean, why did he, why did he stick with this Anton Walter instrument, its maker? Why did he love it so much? Apparently, it was one of the best instruments that Walter ever built. It's one of the earliest of his forte pianos, and it has a very easy action, a very even action, and when Leopold visited his son in 1785. He wrote to his daughter that this very instrument was carried out of the house practically every other day, set up in a theater here, in a concert hall there, in a private place there, and that Mozart was practically giving a concert every other night. Wunderschön. <laughs> For Mozart, music was part of a bigger world of ideas, of culture, of feelings, of people. And that was true in his earlier life too, in Salzburg, as well as in Vienna. The thing is, when Mozart was back in Salzburg, when he came back from his travels, especially as a teenager, he was part of a wider social and cultural scene here. He used to socialise with the family who owned this cafe. He used to play billiards with them upstairs and dance with them, parties, basically. Now, it's inconceivable to me that Mozart, as a supremely intelligent young man, wouldn't have been talking to his friends about his frustrations with his employment in Salzburg, about the poor quality of the musicians here, and maybe also the new political ideas that were emerging all over Europe. Mozart, in other words, was part of cafe culture. Nicholas Till thinks that Mozart's intellectual curiosity is a crucial part of how we should hear and think about his music. If you look at his library, uh, it's not large. He didn't own a huge number of books, but the books he owned were really quite current, contemporary thinking. Mozart is hanging out with the, the Austrian Empire education minister once a week, going round to his house, um, playing music. Van Swieten was a, 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 a very keen um, music lover, introduced Mozart to Bach and, and Handel's music. So this is, he, he's right in the heart of the most progressive aspects of Viennese life at that time. And at that time, Europe was at a foment of pre-revolutionary fever, which Mozart caught in his opera, The Marriage of Figaro, in 1786. In 
the kind of coffee house culture and the intellectual culture that, that Mozart was part of then, I mean, do you think he was sympathetic to the ideals of, of the French Revolution? Do you think Mozart was, was fundamentally a kind of revolutionary? A, a well, of course, we can't project and the French Revolution happens at, at right at the end. Stick women who who could sing and could portray because one thing with Mozart also if you read his letters and everything he really wanted people to be sincere. Così fan tutte with an original text by Lorenzo da Ponte is about a quartet of lovers. The boys are persuaded to test their beloved's fidelity. And the result is confusion and turmoil for all four of them including Fiordeligi. When she struggles, she realises that she has actually fallen, but she's just desperately trying to hold on to the love for Guglielmo. I think Per Pietà is just one of the most amazing arias to, to actually show that. But she always comes back to, always, always comes back to this, that she feels ashamed, that she has this, you know, massive shame that she is, you know, gone towards Ferrando rather than staying constant. It's about us. It is about normal people. They are fighting, they are, you know, they are in love, they are arguing, they are... It's just about normal life. They are betraying, they are being betrayed, they are... It, it's, so it's basically like he's just making an opera about everyday situations, which I think that's why it's so easy to, to take to heart, you know, take to your heart. I remember once when I was doing Susanna in Berlin and I just felt as if everything just parted away from me and I was just sitting there. I could almost see myself as an out-of-body experience and when I looked down I realised that Barenboim had stopped conducting and he was just sitting like this. And that's the moment when you realise that Mozart music, when everything is right, when everyone feels the same, it just becomes one body. And I'm sure that the audience felt it, the orchestra felt it, I felt it, and we all sang and did the same thing. The whole theater were just there in that moment. That's one of the most like, <gasps> experience that I've ever had in my life. What's different in the Mozart operatic women is, a, a, as I say, is this tremendous sort of emotional veracity and, uh, uh, and, and, and a sympathy for them. The, the Countess in The Marriage of Figaro. I mean, she, again, it's another of these places in Mozart that gives you so many different feelings somehow. How, how does he do it? Well, the first time we meet her, as you say, uh, we meet her in soliloquy, just telling us again in, in a very short, slow, 90-second aria, very difficult to sing, that her life is, is really ghastly. I mean, her husband is two years, she hasn't been married, couple of years and already her husband is bonking every woman on the estate and uh, is behaving appallingly to her and she's isolated and miserable and uh, although she has a wonderful best friend in her maidservant Susanna she's essentially alone and there is really nothing more lonely than than poor Germain. <laughs>
women loved him and he loved women. And uh, uh, we can certainly see that in his operas. What I don't want to do, however, is overstress this at all, because he was also a really good bloke. And he had a lot of good bloke friends, too. I mean, the whole Masonic thing, after all, was like you know, the ultimate men's club. <laughs> In Salzburg, there's another piece of Vienna that Mozart's birthplace has uprooted. A little hut that looks like something out of a German fairy tale. And funnily enough, it's where an operatic fairy tale came to life. This is Das Zauberflöte Häuschen, the magic flute hut, uh, where in the summer of 1791, Mozart wrote the magic flute in Vienna, in the grounds of the Freies Theater, where the opera would have its first performance on the 30th of September that year. Now, he would write a little clavichord in there, and he'd invite the singers in to try out things, what aria he was going to write for Josefa Weber, his sister-in-law, who was singing the part of the Queen of the Night, and the rest of the cast. And really, the experience of the magic flute for Mozart was being part of an artistic collective. He was simply uh, one part of this huge, popular, populist, and Masonic theatrical mishmash, glorious theatrical hybrid that is the magic flute. And this is where it happened. And as if by magic, here is uh, the Queen of the Night's Act Two aria, the one that goes. <laughs> I can't even whistle that high. This is, you know, he he was writing absolutely specifically for his sister-in-law. Yeah, um, only Josefa, only the Weber girls could uh, could get up that high. And um, well, I can't even whistle there. Salzburg also houses the delicate instrument on which Mozart composed the magic flute, his tiny treasured clavichord. Clavichords were meant for private use. They do not carry the sound; doesn't carry, and. I show it to you because it's really remarkable. If we open the lid, mm -hmm. we see a small paste in, and Constanze Mozart tells us that this is, this is Constanze Mozart's this handwriting. This is Constanze's handwriting, and she tells us that her husband had composed the magic flute, the requiem, and a Freemason cantata on this very instrument during the last months of his life. So small was this instrument, it would be quite possible to carry it to the, the hut, the Zauberflöte Häuschen, where he composed much of the magic flute uh, in the summer of 1791. Definitely, I mean, this may weigh some 40 pounds, 50 pounds, so you can really take it with you. It's easy to tune, so it's a very practical instrument for this purpose. And if you should carefully open the lid, mm -hmm. What does it sound like, Ulrich? I know it's a quiet sound, but what does it sound like? And in this same room, there's the most moving, honest likeness of the composer. This is as close as we have to a real-life picture of Mozart. This is really as close as we're going to get to what he actually looked like. It was painted from life around 1789 by Mozart's brother-in-law, Josef Langer. It's an encounter with uh, a real, as opposed to airbrushed, idea and image of Mozart. His hair is loose, there's no wig here. You can't see pock marks on his skin, but there's grey in the hair. And this is a, a really a tender picture of who this musician, who this composer was. This picture is usually called unfinished, but in fact you can see very close up that the head and shoulders are, are really a complete little portrait of Mozart.
Violinist Paul Robertson has a relationship with Mozart's music that most of us will never have, hopefully. An appreciation that can come only from the outer limits of life itself. I used to, as it were, preach the idea that music should be played to people in coma. And uh, I remember a lovely lady whose husband fell into a coma played his favorite piece, which is the slow movement of the Mozart clarinet quintet. She very kindly used our recording as it happened. And he recovered. He came round into consciousness during the course of that movement. And my family, when I was in coma, um, were playing the same piece. It was a drug-induced coma that then became an out-of-reach coma. So I was not actually, strictly speaking, alive. So they played me Mozart, and I was responding. So I didn't actually have the registration of listening to Mozart. I mean, to be, as, to be honest, what I was, well, what I was hearing was an Indian, beautiful Indian female voice singing ragas with exquisite microtones. Which, which you remember? Oh, I remember that most distinctly. It was just so beautiful. And you remember as if it were a performance or as if it was happening or it was... Oh, it was almost more real than life, you know. Paul, I spent a lot of this film thinking about Mozart's humanity um, and how that's expressed in the music, grounded it is and how grounded he is. But can we talk also about... Uh, a transcendence in Mozart's music, and if, if so, what might it be? Um, he, and despite all the mythology, he strikes me as being what you might call supranormal. You know, he wasn't just normal, he was what normal ought to be. You know, anyone who could be playing billiards, drinking coffee, writing a great symphony at the same time, caring about his family and their aspirations, also longing for independence, uh, this is a very high-functioning man indeed, caught in a particular web of history, as we all are. So the transcendence is more than just musical. I think it, it, try, it actually runs throughout and across his life. There are these beautiful individuals, sometimes weird and wacky individuals, who, who just have a whole range of, of uh, abilities, skills, insights, cognitive function that, that are always going to be something we just get a crick in the neck looking, because it's, it's so elevated. He began to prove that a composer could actually live an independent, creative life. Now, that takes a different kind of genius, because that's imaginative in terms of conceiving of a state of life that is beyond the one that you currently know. What would he be doing now, you know, a Mozart now? I mean, my own belief is he'd probably be writing for um, computer games because I suspect that he would be drawn to the most creative area, probably the most lucrative area, and the place where he really needed to exercise all his skill to the very extreme. After his death, researchers have put forward over a hundred potential causes. Mozart's body was interred in a mass grave, unmarked and unremarkable. This wasn't the romantic fate of an artist misunderstood or undervalued, but common practice in Joseph II's Vienna, the result of liberal reforms to show that in death all men are equal. Vienna put up this statue to Mozart here in St. Mark's Cemetery where he was buried somewhere on the 7th of December 1791. But it can only ever be a best guess as to where his bones actually are. I like the fact that Mozart's grave can never become a fetish for memorial in the way that Oscar Wilde's, Jim Morrison's or Ludwig van Beethoven's are. We may not know where his body finally came to rest, but we do know where his music is. Thanks to its virtuosity of empathy, of compassion, of humanity, Mozart's music rightly belongs in the bodies, the minds and the imaginations of anyone who loves it. <laughs>